The room was cold, but the atmosphere was electric. Huddled in rows, thirty inmates of Peveril Internment Camp on the Isle of Man were held in taut expectation. James Larrett Battersby, known around the camp as the Mad Hatter, had rallied these men, promising them a spectacle of a speech. Battersby was known for being a powerful salesman. His stories from the time in the British Union of Fascists and his own rousing speeches had helped him sell this proposition. The man they had come to see? Thomas St. Barb Baker. His reputation preceded him. He was loud, outspoken, and known as a radical Christian. Some had their suspicions, however, and pegged him as more of a con artist than convert. Whether by fortuitous coincidence or by design, he had made friends with the richest people in the camp, and seemed to target those with purchasable loyalties and money to spend. This didn't dent the excitement of the men that had filled the room to hear him speak. Baker said he had a direct revelation from the Holy Spirit he had to share. And, as he stepped up in front of these men, there did seem to be a sense of some sort of presence around him. Battersby would say that this was because of his connection to God. Others would say it was his own cocksure confidence and heightened self-perception. As Baker began gesticulating, his voice filling the room, Battersby was enthralled. The men enraptured and something was being born. Something that would change the lives of Battersby, Baker, and the other men and women that would join them. A new group. A new organisation. A new league of Christian reformers. As Baker reached the end of his stirring rhetoric, his brow was beaded with sweat, his voice becoming hoarse. Even before he finished his final words, the men before him leapt to their feet, applauding, raising their arms and shouting, Heil Hitler. This was the moment that marked the beginning of the League of Christian Reformers. That was 1942, but the story begins a decade earlier. Oswald Mosley, a politician of limited success, founded the British Union of Fascists in 1932, and it was here that all of the founding members of the League would find their starts. The true power and leader of the League, Thomas St. Barb Baker, became a prominent member of the BUF and was friends with Oswald Mosley himself. James Larratt Battersby, Baker's loyal disciple and fellow founder of the League, was a donor and organiser for the British Union of Fascists. He became the district leader for the Stockport branch and rose to be a prominent speaker. Known to give engaging speeches to attentive and enthusiastic audiences, Battersby became known as an effective, well-reasoned and powerful speaker that contributed much to the coffers of the BUF. Baker and Battersby met another two men in Peveril internment camp, Arthur Schneider and W.G. Barlow. Schneider would become the League's most fervent supporter and avid member, and had been a district leader of the Kidderminster branch of the BUF, serving as an effective recruiter for the movement, taking the branch's membership from eight members to 20 in 1939. Barlow had been a famous racing driver before joining the BUF and eventually being interned at Peveril with Baker, Battersby and Schneider. However, the BUF was not the only fascist organisation prominent in Britain in the pre-war years. Nor was it the only fascist organisation the members of the League were a part of. Baker had been a member of the Nordic League, one of the most virulent pro-Nazi organisations, that promoted extremist measures to push Nazism from 1939 to 
from 1935 to 1939. Once the Nordic League was officially disbanded at the outbreak of war in 1939, Baker remained a member of the BUF before being arrested under Regulation 18B in 1940. These political views and affiliations were what brought the future members of the League to the attention of MI5 and the government, and led to their arrest under Defence Regulation 18B. Regulation 18B allowed the government to intern without trial those individuals they deemed as a threat to the nation by being opposed to the war against Germany. As Aaron Goldman records, Regulation 18B gave the Home Secretary the ability to take action against anyone who was or who had been a member of an organisation subject to foreign influence or control or whose leaders had had sympathies with the system of government of an enemy power. This provision was primarily aimed at Oswald Mosley and the BUF, which meant it brought the future members of the League directly into the line of fire, as all of them were members of the BUF itself and other fascist organisations. Battersby, originally the wealthy director of the successful Battersby Hats firm, was arrested in June 1940. Taken to Camp 020 at Latchmere House in London, and while there, wrote a diary that was later published as The Bishop Said Amen, on the author's experiences during detention as a pacifist, in which he complained about how everything possible was done to agitate, frustrate, and torment us. From there, he was transferred to the internment camp in Berkshire, nicknamed Ascot Concentration Camp by the BUF, with fellow blackshirt Charlie Watts. He was eventually moved to Peveril Internment Camp on the Isle of Man, where he met Thomas St. Barb Baker and was converted to Baker's extreme form of Christianity. He was eventually released from Peveril in 1943 and began preparations for the setting up of the League of Christian reformers. However, for Baker to end up in Peveril, the process was slightly longer. During the roundup of known and prominent fascists, Baker went on the run. He shaved his distinctive walrus moustache, changing his appearance, before finally being found and imprisoned in Peveril for the rest of the war. He was one of the last to be released, even after Oswald Mosley himself. Even before his internment, Baker had been on the more fanatical and outrageous end of the fascist and religious spectrum, even going as far as to think that some marks on his baby son's forehead constituted a swastika, and his son was, therefore, the heir to Hitler. This led to his wife becoming increasingly worried about his deranged beliefs and filing for divorce. While in Peveril, rumours began to arise from guards and fellow inmates that maybe Baker was not everything he made out to be. According to one officer at Peveril, Baker seemed not to have the light of Nazi ideology burning in his eyes, and that everything he did was calculated, that he potentially feigned madness in an effort to secure early release. Even a German psychologist interned with Baker was forced to remark, the man was a fool with neither brain nor idea. Rumours even rose that Baker only associated with Battersby because he was interested in Battersby's money. Whether his politics or religion were genuine or staged for gain, we might never truly know. Whatever his true motivations were, however, they still led him to convert his fellow inmates and set up the League of Christian Reformers. Arthur Schneider, the son of an Austrian immigrant and an outspoken anti-British fascist, had been watched by MI5 since 1938. He was arrested twice and taken before the Home Office Advisory Committee before eventually being sent to Peveril in 1941. Like Battersby, he was converted by Baker, and even wrote to his wife, a fellow BUF member in 1943, to explain his newfound revelation, to which she replied, 
Your most peculiar letter arrived here this morning. That you had a definite motive in writing such an absurd letter, I'm quite sure. But what your motive is, I haven't the least idea. Nor do I think you believe the rubbish you wrote to me. If you do, then you are crazy, all right? I must admit that it puzzled me very much that it even got here, why the censor allowed it, and so on. But I do not intend to discuss the subject. You should know my views by now. The only heartfelt wish I have is that Hitler gets all that is coming to him, even quicker than it inevitably will come. Schneider, along with Baker, was one of the last to be released from Peveril in 1945. W.G. Barlow was to be the man who eventually gifted their league their future headquarters at Kingdom House in Petworth. The fame and fortune he had won during his successful racing career was outshone by his political affiliations, and he too was arrested under this new regulation. In Peveril, and upon meeting Battersby, Baker and Schneider, his fascism was infused with the religious convictions of these men, leading to him joining the Hitler worshippers after the war. Originally buying River House in Petworth, a large property set in a considerable swathe of land, as a place to settle down with his wife and family after his release, he gifted it to Baker and Battersby, without his wife's knowledge or approval. The League renamed the property Kingdom House, and Arthur Schneider moved in during the summer of 1945 to begin preparations for the house to serve as the headquarters for the League upon Baker's eventual release. While on the Isle of Man, Schneider had converted his entire family, including his two sisters, who quickly joined him at Kingdom House. They left their Women's Land Army hostel in late September 1945. They had been, and continued to be, avid evangelists for their Hitler religion. Schneider had written a letter to his sisters in 1943, praising them for doing their very best to acquaint as many people as possible with their newfound faith. Indeed, they had converted their friend Angela Lincoln, who had shared a room with them in the hostel. When Baker was finally released, he arrived at Kingdom House with an excited following and a church ready for him. In their early days, they remained relatively quiet, keeping themselves to themselves and only very rarely engaging the outside world. They would make occasional visits to local churches, trying to convince them to accept their creed, but mostly kept a rather low profile. That was until the German embassy in London was closed and its contents began to be auctioned off. On the 27th of September, 1945, James Larratt Battersby attended the auction at the former German embassy in London. While there, he purchased a couple of swastika flags that would make a suitable accompaniment to their portrait of Hitler in Kingdom House. He also bumped into an old friend, another former 18B internee, Robert Gordon Canning. He had been a prominent fascist before the war, a gun runner for Arab forces that opposed the administration in Palestine during the 30s, and had been a part of the Nordic League whilst also being a member of the BUF. He became very close friends with Mosley, travelling with him to Italy to visit Mussolini, and even on a trip to Germany to meet Hitler. Gordon Canning eventually left the BUF in 1938 after quarrelling with Mosley. He had ties to the League of Christian Reformers, but there is no evidence to suggest that he was ever a full member. Gordon Canning was at the auction with one acquisition in mind. A huge granite bust of Adolf Hitler. He purchased it for around £500, equivalent to around £23,000, today. Or so the newspapers reported. Gordon Canning was quick to challenge this, writing a letter to the Truth newspaper in which he confirmed that he had purchased it for around a thousand pounds, not a mere 500. He wrote, I mention this fact not because it is of any particular interest to me, but because several irate politically inspired critics called the sculpture trash. When asked about his purchase on the day, his response was confusing to the public, 
but encouraging to Battersby. He said, Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus was mocked, scorned, and crucified. Today, he is a living force in the hearts and minds of millions of people in the West, and those who mocked and scorned him and tried him are today of no account. To the press, to the public, to everyone there on the day, Gordon Canning compared Hitler to Jesus Christ and made his feelings plain. Now, with the bust in his possession, he headed to Petworth and Kingdom House. The bust would be housed there, a fitting companion to Battersby's flags, and a disturbing statement of intent. This also launched the League into the public eye, brought them to the attention of Parliament, and spelled the beginning of their downfall. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Present History Podcast and the first episode in our Hitler's Kingdom Come project. Check back next week for the next instalment of the story of the British cult that worshipped Hitler. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok, subscribe on YouTube and check out our website at presenthistory.co.uk so you never miss a piece of content. For all the links, references, and citations, make sure to check out the website, where we have a list of all the newspapers, articles, books, and publications that we used to inform our work. It might be hard to believe, but we didn't make any of this up. And we'll see you next time on the Present History Podcast.